Ah, the cranes have returned to Columbus. You've probably heard of the swallows returning to Capistrano and the buzzards to Hinkley, but in Columbus it's the construction cranes. I think they must nest here over winter and with the first warm days of spring, you can hear their groaning, cranking sounds. The advent of interstate highways carving up cities, society seems to think that happiness is the destination instead of the way to travel. It was once said that Columbus skyline was marked with church steeples. These days, it's construction cranes. Picture it. Columbus, 1875. Ulysses S. Grant, a Union Army General from Ohio, was in the White House. The country was deep into reconstruction and healing from the Civil War just 10 years before. And it was just a year before the big centennial celebration. Since 1835, the Central Ohio Insane Asylum had stood on 30 acres of land fronting Broad Street between what are now Washington Avenue and Hamilton Park. It was the largest institutional building in the country and one of several built close to populated centers to care for the blind, the deaf and dumb, and feeble-minded and imbecile youth. Really, that's what they were called. Society liked to keep their institutions close to make themselves feel good that they were caring for the less fortunate and as a reminder that there but for the grace of God. Around 1875, a large portion of the downtown stretch of Broad Street was converted into lush boulevard with tree-lined medians. Local businessman William Deschler designed the streetscape after seeing the tree-lined boulevards of Paris. The road was still made up of dirt and not significantly changed until 1873 when gravel and broken rock was added. By the early 1930s, increasing automobile traffic made its streetscape a dangerous obstacle. So in 1932, after a public vote, the trees were cut down, the medians removed, and the street was widened by two lanes. Until 1870, when the city annexed land east of the city limits at Parsons Avenue, which was then called East Public Lane, beyond this point, Broad Street was a dirt toll road called Bush's Plank Road. And except for a few homes and toll stations scattered around, the area was mostly still in farmland. If you check out the photos on the Urban Chateau's Companion Facebook page, you can see wide open space and just a few sapling trees around some of the first mansions built. The asylum burned in 1868, and a new facility was moved to a hilltop on the west side of the city. The property where the asylum once stood was laid out with three boulevards, Jefferson, Lexington, Hamilton Park, and the city began planting out the area. The street names reflect the patriotic fervor that was building for the centennial in 1876. Besides the ones I mentioned, there's Washington, Hamilton, Grant, Monroe, Madison, Garfield, and more. It was one of the very first suburban areas in Columbus made possible by the installation of the city's first horse-drawn streetcars in 1863. And my house was built in 1875, but most others weren't built until the economic boom of the mid-1880s and later. So it sat for several years until the area began to fill in with grand mansions of elite businessmen and politicians. It became known as the Silk Stocking District in reference to the expensive clothing of its wealthy residents. I mean, a pair of shoes cost 98 cents in 1875 and a suit cost $10. Again, on the Urban Chateau's Companion Facebook page, there are photos and histories of several of the homes that stood here, and you'll see that they really were palaces, or at least chateau, even by French standards. One was 10,000 square feet with 21 rooms and eight bedrooms, and several actually captured the French Second Empire style of architecture with mansard roofs and towers. You can trace the uh, period the homes were built by their styles, from federal, to French, to Italianate, Queen Anne and Eastlake, to Mission and Arts and Crafts in the early 20th century. A few remnants of grand homes remain if you look for them, like curb walls and ornamental iron grating and fencing with granite posts. And a few homes too remain, um, like the Jones Mansion, who is a, a dry goods merchant. 
and uh, a few homes on Hamilton Park here up around the left as well. One of the uh, remaining streets that were laid out after the asylum was burned down um, here behind us. And the house that stood here was built around 1888 for Mary Frisbee, who was the widow of a hardware merchant, and took up the entire block along East Broad Street between Hamilton Park and Garfield Avenue, just before the church there, and had a huge three-story turreted carriage house. It was raised in 1961 and replaced by a monolithic office building, which was just recently demolished to build a monolithic apartment building. In the houses that used to be on the corner of Monroe and Broad Street, the one in the sp open space we're looking at now was where the ambassador to Germany's home was. And on the opposite corner where a heart clinic that was built in the 1970s is now, used to be the home of Governor James Cox from Dayton, who was governor in the early 1900s. Time travel over 150 years can make you tired and hungry. So for our first appetizer of the series, we're going to be making something quick and simple. It's called cake salé. It's spelled S-A-L-E, but it's pronounced salé. It's usually a savory cake. But the cool thing about it is you can mix anything in it that you want. You can put you know, red and yellow bell peppers in it with some Parmesan cheese is good, um, just about anything. And it does look more like a small bread loaf than a cake, but we use cake flour in it. As I said, I'm making it a little bit sweet today, so I'm adding some dates and some goat cheese. No sugar, but milk, extra virgin olive oil, three eggs, and a dash of pepper. A little music there. Um, and that's all it takes. So we'll be mixing the ingredients up here and we'll be preparing a little cocktail too to go with it in just a moment. Next we're going to stir in some sifted cake flour, again about 70 grams, which is about 5 ounces by the way, and a half a tablespoon of baking powder. Stir that together till it's smooth. Maybe a little hand sifter here. Once we have that to a smooth consistency, make sure all of the flour is stirred into the egg and milk mixture. And once that's stirred well, we need to fold in the dates, give it that touch of sweetness to the flavor. And really, you can add in as much as you want. I've probably eaten half this bag already, so it um, should be just about right, though. And there you go. Pour that into an 8 inch loaf can. It's lined with parchment paper. By the way, the word salé in French means salted, so this is salted cake. Although there's no salt in the recipe. Go figure. The French. That's so strange. Okay. Should I get that last lump of goat cheese in there? And we'll pop it in the oven now. And we'll put them in the oven for about 35 to 40 minutes at 350. 
and now we wait. So the cake salé is out of the oven now. I'm going to let it cool, still in the pan, on a wire rack for a few minutes, and then lift it up with the parchment paper, let it cool a few more minutes on the wire rack before I slice into it. But what do you think? We'll find out soon. Okay, I think our cake salé is cooled long enough now. I've taken it out of the pan, still on the parchment paper, still on the, on the wire rack. And I'm going to slice off some pieces here. Uh, nice and warm. So golden brown on top and it looks like it has a buttery finish to it. It's shiny and warm. See the dates in it and the goat cheese. Hmm. So light and moist. I mean, it's not it's not dense like a cake would be if you used regular flour in it. Hmm. Can I offer you a piece? I'll include the recipe in the description of the video below. So you can try it yourself, but try using your own ingredients in it and let me know what you think. Let me know what you've used. We'll have to get together and compare. Hmm. Good. Bon appetit, as Julia Child would say. Since we started this series with a quick and easy appetizer today, I thought I'd do the same with a cocktail as well. It's called an L&T and it's simply Lille and tonic water. Lille is kind of a light amber, kind of a Chardonnay colored liqueur. You might have seen in the grocery store in the wine area. Make sure if you order it from a bar or restaurant, you pronounce it Lille and not Lille. Lille is a glass of milk, so quite different. The recipe calls just for an ounce and a half of lile, three ounces of cold tonic water, in a tumbler full of ice and garnished with a half round of orange. And since blood orange is in season right now, I decided to add that today uh, for a little extra color and a lot more flavor as well. Uh, it really is so good. Lile is one of my favorites. This is perfect for uh, late spring or summer afternoon happy hour time. By the way, some of the appetizers and the cocktails I'll be sharing with you, you can find in a new book by David Leibovitz called Drinking French. It has everything from appetizers and coffees and aperitifs and aperos and cocktails from simple to hard, but they're all good. So I'll include a link to it in the description of the video below if you'd like to order a copy from Amazon. Thanks for visiting me today. Sante and bonne journée.